Well, grace and peace to you, CBE family. It is my absolute joy to be with you this morning. I was introduced to CBE through the writings of Dr. Aida um, Spencer. And I don't know if she knows this. <laughs> While I was in seminary, I was introduced to CBE through her writings, and a few years later, um, I had the great privilege of working at the same institution um, where she taught at. And during that time, I called on her numerous times to help me as I gather female seminarians uh, to help affirm their call to ministry. And every time she was so gracious. So I just want to thank you, Dr. Spencer, for the impact you've had on my life and the life of women worldwide. It was at a girl, Gordon Conwell at a chapel service that I actually met Mimi Haddad a few years later. As, you know, as God would have it, these divine connections are what have me standing here before you today. And so I just want to publicly thank Mimi and her staff, CBE staff, for the time, the energy, the love, the attention that you poured into this beautiful gathering. Thank you all so much. Surprisingly, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time this morning discussing Galatians 3.28. I think those who have gone before me have done so beautifully. I will, however, highlight the overarching promise I gleaned from the last few days regarding this passage. And that is, Galatians 3.28 is a passage about understanding who you are, where you are positioned, and what you are promised. Understanding who you are, identity, where you are positioned, positioning, and what you are promised, promise. Identity, position, promise. These three words resonate loudly in a story about sisters nestled in the book of Numbers, in a culture where being a daughter meant you were less than or second class citizens. We find a story of courageous sisterhood. So if you have your Bibles or your cell phones, if you would please go with me to the book of Numbers. Numbers, the 27th chapter, verses 1 through 11. And it reads, The daughters of Zelophehad, son of Hefer, the son of Gilead, the son of Machir, the son of Manasseh, belonged to the clans of Manasseh, son of Joseph. The names of the daughters were Mahlau, Noah, Hagla, Milcah, and Tirzah. They came forward and stood before Moses, Eleazar the priest, the leaders, and the whole assembly at the entrance to the tent of meeting, and said, Our father died in the wilderness. He was not among those Korah's followers who banded together against the Lord, but he died for his own sin and left no sons. Why should our father's name disappear from his clan because he had no son? Give us property among our father's relatives. So Moses brought their case before the Lord, and the Lord said to him, What Zelophehad's daughters are saying is right. You must certainly give them property as an inheritance among their father's relatives and give their father's inheritance to them. Say to the Israelites, if a man dies and leaves no son, give his inheritance to his daughter. If he has no daughter, give his inheritance to his brothers. If he has no brothers, give his inheritance to his father's brothers. If his father had no brothers, give his inheritance to the nearest relative in his clan that he may possess it. This is to have the force of the law for the Israelites as the Lord commanded Moses. 
This is the word of the Lord. By way of, con of providing context, we see here in Numbers 26, the children of Israel have come out of the wilderness and Moses is conducting a census of the tribes. He's dividing up the land and handing out inheritance according to clans. This was not the first census. The first one was conducted 38 years before. But during this span of time, every person over the age of 20 died in the wilderness, except for Caleb, Joshua, and Moses. So the people who emerged from the wilderness were born there. This large group of people didn't know anything but the wilderness. They don't know what it's like to have plenty they had, had, they've had to depend on God to provide for them every day. From birth, they were raised on the promise of what was to come. But for our five sisters, something is preventing them from obtaining the promise. They have a justice issue. Their father, Zelopha, had died in the wilderness and left them no brothers. And this was a problem because according to Hebrew law, the family rights and property were passed on through sons. Here they were so close to the promised land, they could literally see it. It was within their grasp. That thing that they had been promised for years was right in front of them. God had kept his promise and delivered them out of the wilderness. Now it appeared it was all for naught. Can you imagine what that must have felt like? To be told that the promise that, it, that had seen them through the hard, long wilderness, that, that, that had been their source of encouragement and hope, that, that, that thing that, that they stayed up at night and told stories about was denied to them. The law said they could not inherit, not because of anything they had done, but because of a circumstance they had no control over their gender. This, my friends, is the moment that we enter the narrative. The setting is the tent of meeting. The sisters enter and make their way towards Moses. We know it's a busy place because of all the people listed in the tent. These five young ladies pressed their way in a crowd of people. They waited for the appointed time and then they came forth. Somehow, some way, they found the courage to come forth. Courage, 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 courage. Courage is the ability and the willingness to confront fear, pain, danger, uncertainty, and intimidation. Physical courage is courage in the face of physical pain, hardship, death, or threat of death, while moral courage is the ability to act rightly in the face of popular opposition, shame, scandal, or discouragement. It took physical and moral courage for them to come forward. My friends, it's going to take courage for you to confront injustice in the world that we live in today. For most of us, physical courage is not the issue, right? It is the question of moral courage that we wrestle with. Will you have the moral courage to speak up, to refuse to be pacified with easy answers, to not turn a blind eye to oppression? Will we have the moral courage to come forward? I want to suggest to you this morning that there were three things that fueled the moral courage or the 
physical courage or the courage in general of these five sisters. Desperation, solidarity, and identity assurance. These sisters were desperate. They didn't have another choice. It, it was a matter of life and death for them. If they don't do something, it would mean the end of their father's line. I'm sure some people in the crowd thought they were pushy or, or rude or inappropriate, and still others probably balked at the audacity of these women to even be present. They had no business being there. They should be satisfied with their lot in life. Has anyone heard that before? <laughs> desperation causes us to act. Sometimes desperation makes people do really stupid things. I'm a witness. I've done a few things that I thought, oh, why'd you do that? But on the other hand, most of the change movements in the history of humankind have been birthed out of a sense of desperation. People decide that enough is enough. I think of the desperate young mother who has endured her share of beatings and for this, this last time she's decided I'm done. She takes her children and today is the day that she leaves or the people who escape war-torn countries and cross land and sea to seek asylum and refuge in some place less volatile. Desperation. Have you ever been there? So desperate for change in your situation that you take risks you never thought you'd take. Oftentimes, what morphs a desperate act into a courageous act is simply timing. At the appointed time, they came forth. Next, I want to suggest that the fact that they were united in mission fueled their courage. They came forward together all five of them against the world. They had no idea what Moses was going to decree, but they came forward together. If they were going to go down, if their father's lineage was going to be wiped out, at least they'd go down together. What a wonderful picture of unity and solidarity. Not only did they come forward together, verse 2 tells us that they stood together, all of them a collective group. What a blessing it must have been to be standing before their leader and all of the multitude of congregation knowing that they had each other's back, knowing that they were not standing alone. I can relate to this because I, I grew up with two sisters and, and have a large extended family. And when I went to high school, um, there was two of my, my two sisters and I and two of my cousins were at the same high school. So there were five of us girls together and we thought we were untouchable, right? If you mess with one, you mess with all of us. You hear the term solidarity used often in conversations about justice. Solidarity is defined simply as unity or agreement of feeling or action, especially among individuals with a common interest. These five sisters give us a biblical picture of solidarity. So let me ask you something this morning. As you confront injustice in whatever context you find yourself in, who's coming forward with you? Who is standing with you? The, pre the people that you have around you will make or break your justice efforts, your efforts to live and walk in mutuality. The people that you have around you, are they like-minded? 
Do they share your compassion for the populations that you're called to serve? Are they as desperate or hungry as you are for the promise? Will they be as tenacious or as committed? Will they wait with you? Will they suffer with you? Will they bear with you? You need to find people who will have your back. When the enemy hits you with all that he hits you with, unexpected delays, budget constraints, all of the things that we know happens every day in ministry, every day in life, who is standing with you? The daughters of Zelophehad had faced a daunting task, a justice giant, if you will, but they faced it together. This is why having a community of believers is so vitally important, my friends, because when I doubt or when I can't remember or I'm too battered down by the burdens and pressures of life, someone else in the family can begin to speak for me. When I'm too overwhelmed by the sheer size of the justice giant in front of me, my brother and sister can remind me of the size of my God. That person standing with me can assure me that we have never seen the righteous forsaken, nor has seen begging bread. They can remind me that many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered us out of them all. All, out of them all. Yes, that community of believers. This is the beauty and the power of people united in solidarity towards mission. This notion of solidarity, it goes a little deeper than mere friendship. In her book, I Bring the Voices of My People, A Womanist Vision for Racial Reconciliation, Shanika Walker Barnes shares that in friendship, people move towards one another. In solidarity, people run together toward a greater objective. With solidarity, it's not only important that we come together, it also matters how we come together. We have to work internally and externally. That is, we must align with one another in ways that embody the society that we are attempting to build. The daughters of Zelophehad came forward together. They stood together and they said, they spoke, they were not silent. The Bible says we overcome by the blood of the lamb and by the words of our testimony. My friends, my friends, my friends, your testimony is not just for you. That thing that God did that blew your mind, that moment when your passion for justice was ignited, that is to be shared. It is to be used for you to encourage your brother and sister when they can't encourage themselves. For you to declare the promises of God for others when they are waiting for their then moments. You do this knowing that you're paying it forward, right? You, you, you know that it, it's... It's not you this time, but that when your time comes, someone is going to do the same thing for you. When you give voice to the voiceless, when, when you help restore a measure of power to those who are powerless, know that the law of reciprocity is at work. Whatever you sow, that you shall also reap. This is the beauty and the power of people united in solidarity towards mission. Thirdly, the daughters of Zelophehad had, had identity assurance. They knew a few things about their father, about themselves, and about the God that they served. 
The daughters had a common understanding of the nature of their earthly father. They said he didn't hang out with the rebellious ones. He wasn't a part of the group that rebelled against Moses and God consumed by fire. He died in his own sin or of natural causes. We know him. We know his character. He is an innocent. He had done no wrong. Why should he be stripped of his legacy? Because he had no sons. They knew who they were and whose they were. There was no identity crisis with these sisters. They understood that in their culture, honor, shame, and reputation were all connected to names. Their father's name and reputation was honorable. His name was connected to a legacy that could be traced back to the covenant. Therefore, they were entitled to all the rights and privileges that were associated with his name. And here's where we pick up Galatians again. Now, do you see why Paul was so frustrated with the Galatians in the third chapter and first verse? They were living under old identities and going by names that no longer applied to them. They had been given new identities in Christ and were acting as if they were still bound to the old names. How many of us do this? We act as if we're still bound to what Christ has already delivered us from. Reverting back to old ways of thinking and acting and being instead of living into our new identities in Christ. I will confess that I do. And occasionally I have to be reminded of my Christhood, as Andrew Bartlett did so eloquently yesterday. Not only did the sisters understand the character of their father and the power of his name, ultimately the sisters knew the character of God. They knew God to be a just God. God had shown God's self to be faithful time and time again. Every day, God provided manna from heaven. God was a covenant-keeping God. They had a long history with this God. God, his reputation preceded God's self, and God's track record was Sound. Surely that God wouldn't deliver us out of the wilderness and allow for some ridiculous law to keep us from getting our inheritance. Have you ever had someone try to tell you something about your God that wasn't in line with who you knew God to be? I must confess that in this culture in this day of age, it's a, it's a little disheartening in these current cultural conversations around justice in the church. I, I often find myself scratching my head and asking, are we talking about the same God? I am convinced that one of the impediments to the church engaging in God's justice mandate is that we don't see justice as intrinsic to our missional identity. Throughout scripture, we see this emphasis on justice, right? From Abraham to the daughters of Zelophehad to, to Ruth, through the Old Testament prophets to the ministry of Jesus, through Paul's missionary journey in the formation of the church of Acts to Revelations. The motif of justice is woven through God's redemptive narrative. For the Israelites, this understanding was put in writing at Sinai. Arthur Glasser says this, there was one stipulation that stands out above all others, the covenant obligation that Yahweh's people practice justice and show mercy to the poor and minority groups within the land. 
pointing to the passages in Isaiah that refer to the kingdom, theologians Glenn Stason and David Gushy tell us that out of Isaiah's kingdom delivering passages, 16 of the 17 announced that justice was a key characteristic of God's kingdom. When exploring justice as a vital component of the church's missional identity, one only has to look to Jesus. As the inaugurator of the kingdom, we see by his actions and his teaching that Jesus embodies kingdom justice. In particular, Jesus' mission of love consistently turns to nobody people who have been shoved to the fringes of society. And the gospel gives them many names. The poor, the sick, the blind, the lepers, the demon-possessed, the Samaritans, the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the crowds, the harassed, and the helpless, the weary and the heavy laden, the least, the last, and the lost. Time and time again, Jesus demonstrated his concern for the marginalized. In Matthew, the 23rd chapter, 23rd verse, Jesus says this, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill, and cumin, but you have neglected the most important matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. You should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former. Jesus proclaims the kingdom of God, not just with words, but with powerful, redemptive actions, which address every human need. The same is true of us, his followers. The announcement of the kingdom and the deeds of the kingdom are inseparable. The announcement of the kingdom and the deeds of the kingdom are inseparable. The daughters of Zelophehad had stepped forward in a courage that was fueled by desperation, strengthened by solidarity, and undergirded with a strong assurance of their individual and missional identity. This divine act of courage tucked in the history of the book of Numbers is a powerful reminder of God's sovereignty. These five women wrote a new chapter in the history of Israel. This one act changed the trajectory of their life and the life of other women. Their request set in motion a provision for future daughters. God amended the law for them. Let me say that again. God amended the law for them. They are right in what they are saying. He affirmed their right to receive their promise. Their courage changed an entire system. Oftentimes, I think when the church responds to justice issues, we stop at the individual level, right? Uh, we understand our missional identity in terms of a response to individual suffering. But during the course of Jesus' life, we see him directly confronting people and practices that alienated the socially outcast. Jesus' attack on the temple system was not merely a cleansing, but a prophetic indictment on a corrupt system that was covering up injustice. It is the same confrontation we see in Isaiah 56 and Jeremiah 7. This was not the only time that Jesus spoke to systemic injustices. Stason and Gushy count 40 times in the synoptic gospels, not according, not including the parallel passages, when Jesus confronted the powers and authorities of his day. 
In addition, Jesus performed practices and gave other teachings, which even if not explicitly identified as confrontations of authorities, surely challenged the theological ideology of those in power. When it comes to confronting unjust systems, we must not be lulled into silence and become complicit. Throughout history, the church has remained silent in the face of some of the most atrocious acts of injustice. We must counteract our pattern of unawareness of oppression and violence, exclusion and fear of the other. The church must regain its moral courage, its missional gumption, and its prophetic identity. Before I close, I want to spend a few moments talking about fear. The daughters of Zelopha had did not allow fear to consume them and keep them from obtaining the promise. It is my firm belief that fear diminishes our hope and distorts our vision. When humans fear they'll lose something, they automatically go into preservationist mode. In a post-pandemic, war-torn, terror-filled world, it has become increasingly difficult for us to remain immune to the feelings of hopelessness and fear that permeate our culture. The principalities and powers have become, have become quite adept at preying upon those fears. The media feeds our fears. Politicians campaign on fear. Countries close their borders because of fear. People stockpile weapons out of fear. Fear causes us to retreat behind safe, gated, and walled neighborhoods instead of becoming agents of wholeness and harmony in the land. When our hope becomes diminished, our vision becomes distorted. Allow me to illustrate this with a story. Alice and Kevin moved into a new neighborhood. Kevin was anxious about this new neighborhood. The morning after they moved in, while they were eating breakfast, Kevin sees the young woman next door hanging out the wash. That laundry isn't very clean, said Kevin. She must be using the wrong kind of detergent. She should use what we have. Alice said nothing. Every time the neighbor would hang out or wash, Kevin would say the same thing. That laundry isn't very clean. Why does she use what we have? Then one morning, Kevin pointed out the window, look, her laundry is finally clean. She must have discovered a new laundry soap. Alice shook her head and laughed. No, I don't think there was anything wrong with her laundry. I happened to get up early this morning and I cleaned our windows. <laughs> Fear distorts our vision and leads to distorted thinking. This fear seeks something to blame, and the enemy then takes on a face and morphs into a people group. Soon things like Islamophobia and xenophobia and anti-immigration and anti-refugee and left-wing extremists and right-wing extremists and all sorts of people whose laundry isn't clean emerge. All of a sudden, it is acceptable to hate because their laundry isn't clean. This is the cultural climate that we live in today, my friends. In this climate, justice looks like that watered down Greek Aristotic, Aristotic, Arist, aristocratic excuse me, ethic that claims that we give everyone his due, or that Western ideology that, that equates justice with individual autonomy and reduces it to retribution or punishment. 
But my friends, this is not kingdom justice. This isn't the new creation that we're called to live into. This isn't the posture of people adopted into the same family. In reference to kingdom and to kingdom justice, N.T. Wright states, Jesus summoned people to a different kind of empire, a place where peacemaking, mercy, humility, and a passion for genuine and restorative justice reigns. Paul writes to the Galatians, so in Christ Jesus, you are all children of God through faith. For all of you were baptized into Christ, have, all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, nor is there male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. My identity is found in Christ. My position is secured through Christ. And Christ is the fulfillment of the promise. Family, you and I are citizens of a different type of kingdom. A kingdom where Jesus has come in fulfillment of the promise and removed the barriers of access to provide equity for all. Galatians 3.22 says, but scripture has locked up everything under the control of sin so that what was promised being given through faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. So now my brothers and sisters, I send you forth with the simple prayer that you may have the courage, like those five sisters, to believe. To believe that you've been adopted into a family that celebrates and values you. Believe that this family makes room for your unique contributions and gifts and needs them. Believe that your family stands in solidarity with you and you are called to stand in solidarity with your family. Believe that your voice matters and our collective voices have the power to change unjust systems. Believe that your worth is not determined by your gender, your race, your ethnicity, your any other thing than your positioning in Christ Jesus. Believe that God has removed every barrier that has blocked your access to the promises of God and provided equity for all people through Christ Jesus. May it be so in Jesus' name. Thank you 